All right, ladies, I know you've been there because you're listening to this podcast. You went to your doctors and were diagnosed with hypothyroidism. You were given your levothyroxine or your Synthroid and your doctor said, I'll see you in three to six months. And you walked out thinking, this is it. This is finally the answer to my energy problems, to my weight problems. I'm going to finally feel better. And you maybe, you maybe even felt better for a couple of weeks on that medication and then nothing. And then you suddenly just, all those symptoms came back. You went back to the doctor. He probably said, no, everything looks good. You're good. And you go back to the drawing board thinking, well, I guess it wasn't the thyroid that was making me feel so crummy. Well, today we're going to be talking about just those things, the lab reports, the medication that these doctors are putting you on, how to advocate for yourself. And with me today is McCall McPherson. Hopefully I said that right, McCall. <laughs> uh, it's wide open. You can okay. say it however you please. <laughs> it's wide open. She is the founder of Modern Thyroid Clinic, a thyroid-centered functional medicine practice in Austin, Texas, the owner and chief thyroid hope giver of the thyroid advocacy platform, Thyroid Nation. She is a physician assistant, re recent TEDx speaker, and a thyroid expert by way of being a thyroid patient. Her passion for perfecting thyroid treatment stemmed from years of her suffering due to the mismanagement of her own hypothyroidism. Now she lives, breathes, and thrives in understanding the nuances of proper thyroid care. Her philosophy is simple. There is no reason to still have thyroid symptoms. She spends her time helping to make it so by giving her patients get their lives back and teaching and advocating for the other millions suffering who aren't her patients. So welcome, McCall. I love that bio. Oh, thanks. That was long and lengthy. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> thanks for I having actually, me. I thought about cutting it short. I'm like, no, this is all such great <laughs> stuff. You're just like the woman behind the thyroid, aren't you? <laughs> I am. That is my jam. Yeah. So you didn't start in functional medicine though. You were a psychi you were in psychiatry. Yes. Yeah. It's kind of, it really is an interesting story. So whenever I hit my own thyroid crisis when I was 27 and was going to bed at 3.30 in the afternoon every day, oh. <laughs> like probably so many people listening, um, I was trying to get my own health back and I was on Synthroid and, you know, same exact battle that you just spoke of was my battle. Yep. And eventually I ran into I'm an integrative medicine doc in Austin, or really I waited three months to see him and saw him and he gave me my life back. And I was practicing traditional run-of-the-mill psychiatry. That really opened the door to me to look into integrative and fu functional medicine. And once I kind of stumbled into that realm, I started niching in integrative and functional psychiatry. That was my practice. That's what I did. And about three years into it, I noticed that like 80% of my new patients were thyroid patients in my oh, psychiatry wow. practice. And I'm like, what is happening? And so eventually my first out of state patient flew in to see me for a thyroid. And I'm like, this is a thing. Like I'm good at this. These people apparently are coming. And I guess enough of my depression patients who really had a thyroid problem that I fixed went and took my information and spread it all across the internet about me being a thyroid person that could help people. Amazing. And so they kind of built up this thyroid niche which inside of my psychiatry practice. And I was like, no, I'm, this is my calling. Like this is what I need to do. And so that's how Modern Thyroid Clinic was born. Strange. Strange, but so interesting. And I, you know, I mean, I was diagnosed like a year, year ago now and would never have thought myself a depressed person or down and out. And I remember feeling the feeling of getting thyroid into my body for the first time and being like, oh, oh, yeah. this is what normal is. Like, and I wasn't even, I was kind of like subpar. And then when I had some reverse T3 issues happen and I got severely hypo, yeah. then I was like, oh, this is what really depressed people feel like. Like, this is yeah. horrible. You can't even get off your couch. Yeah. So talk to me about this. What's go, what goes on? What's triggering that with, like, how is that related to thyroid? Let, yeah. So let's dig in even to that reverse T3 component, which was my struggle too. So, oh, was it? I okay. mean, I had inherent loss of thyroid function and I had been treated for hypothyroidism for years. And 
exactly how you described of how you, at first you might feel better and then later you sink into a slump. I call that the three stages of Synthroid and we can dig into that later if you want, but yeah. yes, so true. So that happened to me and then ultimately I started accruing reverse T3, um, which you know, as you talked to me about earlier, there's gonna be so many experts later and before me talking about this specifically, but you know, when it comes to reverse T3, this inhibitory hormone, right? This hormone that blocks our active thyroid hormone from binding and triggering our mood or our energy or our metabolism or whatever it is, it starts getting driven up by almost everyday lifestyle, at least in America, mm -hmm. stress, micronutrient depletion, protein deficiency, caloric restriction, insomnia, you know, all of the inflammatory things that we consume start increasing our reverse T3. And that, I mean, I saw a patient literally today who has perfect thyroid function, but a conversion issue. And so purely the, the end result of regular lifestyle is a reverse T3 problem. So she's depressed. She can't function. She can't lose weight despite effort. You know, I mean, it's just, it's so sad that everyday lifestyle can trigger this one particular issue that our body uses purposefully, right? right? So our body increases reverse T3 so we can't absorb our active hormone so that we get tired. When we're inflamed, it wants us to rest. When we're not sleeping, it wants us to lay down. When we're calorically restricted, it wants us to be tired, lay down and recover. So it drives up that reverse T3 to make us do it so that we yeah. become hypothyroid. Yeah, which this might be a whole nother tangent, but I always wonder about that in the sense of, you know, you start taking straight T3, which is what I started doing. And then it was like, but wait a second, my body's super smart. Why has it downregulated my, or sorry, why has it upped my reverse T3, right? Or why has it downregulated my cortisol? Like it's preserving something. Mm -hmm. It's oh, preserving yeah. me. <laughs> right. right, right. So if you think of 3,000 years ago when we were calorically restricted or didn't have enough protein or micronutrients, our reverse T3 elevated so we could preserve our stores, right? It's smart. Our body's smart. It's making us move into hibernation mode to slow our metabolism so that we don't burn off all our fuel to make us lay down, to make us go into preserve or restorative mode. It's super smart. It's a bummer that all of our lifestyles facilitate you know, elevated reverse T3 now on a fairly common basis, or at least in my perspective. Um, yeah, but that's so, so true. Yeah. And so 80%, you said, of your clients were coming in that had depression, I'm guessing, right? Depression, anxiety. Mm -hmm. And as most doctors, they would have just been put on an antidepressant. And you can't help but think how many women out there are walking around on an antidepressant when it's just their thyroid hormone. You know what's so sad? Um, pretty much, I mean, I'd say 70% of the women that come in to see me, maybe 60, tell me that before they end up in my office, someone tries to tell them they're depressed and that it's in their head, right? Because then the doctor doesn't have to take responsibility for how you feel or your thyroid function or whatever it is if they tell you, oh, it's depression. You just need an antidepressant. This isn't my fault you feel this way. It's not me not managing your thyroid correctly. It's you. It's your problem. And I mean, constantly women are told that. They're told that they're depressed and that's the reason that they have fatigue and brain fog and weight gain and all of these things and low sex drive. You know, or they're made to feel like they're completely crazy and they're out of their mind that it's all in their head. It's devastating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super devastating. What, what exactly is the thyroid doing to the brain when it's low like that? Yeah, you know, on a neurochemistry <laughs> yeah. perspective, I don't know, yeah. you know. I would imagine that it's it probably slows production of yeah. your neurotransmitters, you know. I don't I don't yeah. have any scientific data to back that up. You should certainly look that up, but with thyroid, you know, generally things slow down. And mm -hmm. so slowed production of your hormones, I would assume your neurotransmitters of your metabolism all of those things. But yeah, that's a very good question. I should figure out what's going on. I know. I'd be interested to know. I mean, it's it's part of our body and our body, like you said, it slows down. And I remember just not being able to get off my couch and being super tired. And and so your brain just must 
yeah, it's like it starts to walk through water, right? Everything starts to slow down. And because you feel so horrible, you get depressed. But I know that there's got to be something chemically that actually starts to happen as well, right? I agree. It's a cycle, but I think truly there's a biochemical issue going on that's creating that depression. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, <laughs> Now let's. Ju- I want to jump into actual lab. Like you talk about a lot about lab work and like reading your own lab work and being able to understand it and where our thyroid should be. So you know, let's go back to that typical woman that's walked in. She's been on Synthroid, Levothyroxine, and is told that everything's okay, and yet she does not feel okay. And the TSH looks normal. What's happening? Uh, so <laughs> oh, the TSH. Right. <laughs> So, you know, obviously, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably informed enough to know that in no way can you gauge someone's thyroid status by way of TSH alone. But here's something very, very interesting is that once you're on levothyroxine or Synthroid, you can absolutely no longer rely on the TSH to be an indicator almost at all. And that's because of the way that your biochemical cascade happens in thyroid. If you're taking levothyroxine or Synthroid, that is a man-made form of a hormone called T4. And T4 is an inactive thyroid hormone. I give the analogy of crude oil. So we can't put crude oil in our car, but we need it to make gasoline to put in our car to make it run, right? Does not really do us a ton of good unless we can activate it and convert it into gasoline. So levothyroxine is crude oil. It's what I call conversion dependent. It's dependent on your ability to activate it and make it into gasoline. So the problem is that that T4 hormone largely controls your TSH. It sends a message back to your brain to help regulate your TSH. That's pretty much how your TSH gauges, if it should be low or high. If you have plenty of T4, it lowers. If you don't have enough, your TSH increases. Why? To stimulate your thyroid at an increased rate to produce more hormones if you're hypothyroid, right? So here's the deal with with levothyroxine and Synthroid is that if you're taking a T4 in pill form and you are a poor converter, if you're not able to convert that crude oil to gasoline, you're stockpiling it. You're stockpiling it in crude oil form And so that falsely sends a message back to your brain and lowers your TSH. So actually the worse converter you are, meaning the more bad you are at using your medication, the better your TSH is going to look. Oh, wow. Right. And even if your doctor's a little more progressive and they check TSH and T4, which is pretty much all you'll get at most from conventional medicine. Yeah. Right. What happens then? Same thing. So your T4 looks amazing because you're not using it. It's all just sitting right there in crude oil form. And so it looks fantastic and your TSH looks fantastic. And maybe you might even be told you're over medicated. You are actually (laughs) hyperthyroid right now. And every woman listening is like, but I have every symptom of hypothyroidism. How are you going to tell me I'm hyperthyroid? And it's because your TSH has dropped because you're not using your medication. So what do they do? They reduce your med and you get stuck on that roller coaster. So, you know, big picture is one, you cannot rely on TSH. You can't rely on TSH and T4. Then it goes on from there. You have to always get your, the gasoline hormone looked at. It's the most important hormone. You have to know how much free T3 you have. And then in addition, there's that inhibitory hormone. And again, this comes into play with People who are poor responders of Synthroid and Levothyroxine have to get their reverse T3 checked. Every one of my patients automatically does, but people say, oh no, that one's, you know, it's not that important. It's very important because I see plenty of patients each week that everything looks good when they're on Synthroid or Levothyroxine. They're TSH, they're T4, they're free T3. And then it comes back that their reverse T3 is 28 or 32 and yeah. there's no way they're going to feel good. And if someone's not checking that, even a functional medicine person who often they leave out reverse T3, um, they'll miss it. They'll miss the entire boat. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. exactly what, and that happened to me. I, my T3 was almost over range. Uh, my T4 was perfect range. My TSH was suppressed, which I knew it was supposed to, so I didn't freak out. <laughs> yeah. 
but it, all my labs looked fantastic. And I was like, and you felt I terrible. Feel horrible. <laughs> and I got my reverse T3 checked. And even that wasn't out of range. It was 19. And here the range goes to anything over 25 is above the range, right? And I felt horrible. And, and it's just lucky I know that, you know, not to listen to my, <laughs> to my lab work and to go by how I felt, right? But it, it's still like the lab work, like it's good, but you also have to really go, okay, how do I feel? I you know, like, do I, are, are my symptoms going away? Because I see it being super different for a lot of people as far as like, as With where they lab. are in their labs, right? In the ranges. So that kind of leads me into the next segue of look like, so first you have to get the right labs. You have to get a full panel. And then if you have Hashimoto's workup, that's separate, but this is just mm -hmm. thyroid function. Then you can't look at whatever the lab says is normal as normal. And I want to break this down on like a medical standpoint about how I'm, how clinicians are trained, right? So right. we are trained to look at the lab paperwork and see if it's in bold or off to the side. If it's not, then it's great. And I mean, sure. If you can trust whatever the lab says is normal as being your standard, then that's fine. But there's a few flaws in that. And the first one is that every lab's normal range is different. There is no magical universal range of what's okay for T3 or TSH. So, you know, here in Austin, a Quest Lab in my neighborhood's normal is different than Quest Lab five minutes down the road is different than LabCorp, is different than the hospital. So they're all different. That's one problem. Second problem is that when they make those ranges, what they're doing is they're just selecting a data set of their population in their lab population, right? And they're formulating averages. So just a random population of people. Now someone with severe hypothyroidism who has a TSH of 97, is averaged in with someone who's hyperthyroidism. They are not excluding people with the diagnosis they're trying to rule out when they formulate those averages. So everyone's in one lump sum, formulate averages, and that leaves the normal, quote normal, way too large. So it's, I mean, it's scary wide. Women come every day to my office, obviously, and they're far within the normal range and normal range, mm -hmm. and they feel miserable. So whenever I started my niche in thyroid, I used my normal ranges based on a subset of literature that excluded people with hypothyroidism, ah. family history, or symptoms. And that's what I started with. Great. About every year and a half to two years, I take that range and I trim it down more because I find that if you can get people in an extremely narrow range, extremely narrow margin of like 0.4 of a lot of them, then boom, they get their life back. Wow. Anything outside of that very narrow range, it's not almost a continuum of how bad they feel. It's like as soon as they're outside of the range, they're debilitated. Wow. They're extremely symptomatic. And so it's everything has to be so tightly controlled and what's frustrating as a patient and as a clinician is people think that because hypothyroidism is so common, it's so easy to treat, right? You just give them this pill and you just increase it until you get it right. And it's not. I mean, it has to be precisely controlled in such a finesse way and even a scientific way that unless it is that way, it's almost like winning the lottery of landing on the right dose. You know, it's crazy. I, to, I, yes. Yeah. You're so right. Like if I've learned anything from my own journey is patience, <laughs> Yeah, patience to get it right. Like yeah. it's crazy. The amount of work I've had to do, the amount of lab work I've done. Um, I think I took my temperature five times a day for three months straight and my blood pressure and my heart rate. Like I have it all here. I still have it. I have my, my like thermometer. Right here. I have my, <laughs> like, cause I just randomly still check it. Cause it's still not super stable and I'm just, I'm still working on it. But I always think like, imagine what doctor, like this is what doctors should be doing though. This is what, how every thyroid patient should be treating themselves 
when they're diagnosed with hypothyroidism. You should and be then think about how they are, medication. right? Yeah. And they're really just thrown on twenty five micrograms of Synthroid until they come back the next time, and then it's fifty, and we'll just hope for the best. And then you know, people really believe that that is just the way they're going to feel forever, forever, yes. and it's devastating. Yeah, I figure there's got to be. And I mean, what do you think? Like, I think there's probably maybe. 5% of people with hypothyroidism that are being properly treated. And they're probably all just go to your clinic, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm like, I, yes. I mean, it like it's such so... a small amount. Yes. And I have brilliant functional medicine physician, clinician friends who outdo me in all areas, but they don't know how to do thyroid. And it's not that, I mean, it's just so much finesse. It's so hard. And then you think about it, Levothyroxine is the number one prescribed medication in America. That's scary. Isn't that alarming? Very alarming. <laughs> it's no wonder we have diabetes and high cholesterol and all of these things. It's because no one's thyroid is working. No, uh, that's crazy. Here in Canada, they've just made it, I don't know if it's law, but it's the medical system made it so that doctors are not allowed to test past TSH no matter what, unless there's unless it's out of range so unless no. it's over and ab like high above the range they're not allowed to test t4 and t3 anymore do period you have that is so awful do you have like direct to consumer labs where people can go and get their own labs like we do in america yeah. oh yeah like oh, i good. i sell them on my website i go spot blood spot thyroid testing but then it's like well what now now like i have to send people then i got an email this morning actually i'll, I'll read it for you here i'll pull it up she says um she went to her doctor today to get this because she had her thyroid and her hormones tested she had never seen a saliva hormone test and doesn't trust the validity. She is going to do research and get back to me. She said, the reason my endocrinologist wouldn't give me T3 is because it's very dangerous. She has seen less than a handful of people on it. And she said, they're very extreme cases and rare. Needless to say, she thinks my $260 hormone test was a scam. But until she commits to that theory, she agreed to research it. She will not help with the thyroid. Ooh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. yeah. Another one this morning I got from another client who said, my naturopath saw that my TSH was suppressed and took me off of all my thyroid medication because she was yeah. on desiccated T3, T4. Yeah. So, so uh, I mean, and, and now poor woman is going to have to go through the whole thyroid overhaul all over again because they've taken her off all of her medication. Yeah. I mean, so let's talk a little bit about real risk for- Okay. Yep. Fear based factor of T3. Yes. Right. Yep. So, and you know, a suppressed TSH. Like the, and a suppressed TSH. Yeah. Let's do it. So, and let's break that down. So, real terrible things can happen if you over medicate someone on active thyroid hormone. It can give them a heart arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation that increases their chance of heart attack and stroke, right? So when we're being trained in medicine, literally I can sum, I don't even need to summarize. I can give you my training on thyroid treatment right here, right now. When I studied medicine, it was never use medications with T3 in them, only use medications with T4, which is levothyroxine synthroid. If you use T3 medications, you'll give your patients a heart attack or a stroke. That's what I was taught, which I think is kind of reflective of a lot of clinician training. So yeah. we are indoctrinated with a ton of fear-based dogma around T3 medications. Of course, wouldn't you be? I mean, if, if that was your training? Yeah, so, yeah, I can see now why the doctor said that to her. <laughs> right, right. They're terrified. And so what they do is instead of putting people on gasoline hormone, T3 hormone, they put everyone on crude oil so that there's a rate limiting step, meaning you can only convert so much crude oil to gasoline at one time. So if you give someone only crude oil, you don't have to worry about giving them a heart attack or a stroke because their body will self-regulate how much hormone they can activate at each time. So it's a built-in safety mechanism to protect doctors of sorts. So, you know, if you over-medicate someone on T4 and they can't convert enough to T3, they're not going to get AFib. They're not going to have a heart attack and a stroke, right? So this is where all of that fear comes from. And the reality is this, and this is what I tell literally every patient I have. I can send them all to the risks, benefits, and alternatives of using any medication with T3 because you can bet that they are going to go to their doctor 
at some point, and they are going to hear the exact same spill that that woman heard when it's like, you should never use T3. It's extremely dangerous. Who is this McCall lady, right? <laughs> so pretty much that's a, you know a decent percentage of the time. So I tell everybody, look, here's your real risk. My range for a T3 value is 3.4 to 4. That's my range for a 36-year-old woman or 37, however old I am. For me to put myself into AFib or a patient my age into AFib, my T3 value would need to be 17, 18. So if my range is 3.4 to 4, the likelihood of me getting a patient to 17 is highly unlikely. You know, for an older person, it's always lower. And I have had people transfer to me um, from other clinics where they were getting their labs tested inappropriately. And we can talk about that at, at, at today if you want. Yeah. I'm very specific about that. But, and, and sure, they could have been at risk because they were being over-medicated because they weren't properly being managed. But even then, an older person, you know, let's say 65, 70, their T3 would need to be 13. Right. Again, that, that's a high number compared to three to four or even to five to six. If you over-medicate someone and their T3 is at six, you're over-medicating them. They're not going to go into AFib. No. Long before they go into AFib, they're going to be like, I'm so I'm anxious. Gonna say, like you go point, <laughs> you go five micrograms over your dose that you don't need and you have heart palpitations. Right. You're sweating, your hands right. get all hot, you get diarrhea. Like and then that's at that by five 15. micrograms. Right. Like, yeah, like, you gotta, you gotta going to 17. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So realistically, it's hard to do. Sure, people can do that. They can make giant medical errors, gross negligence, and it's possible, right? But I treat patients who have a history of AFib safely with T3 medications. You have to do your job and you have to do it in a good manner, but it's very safe and effective and it's not dangerous. And the reason people become scared of a suppressed TSH is simply because they are expecting that TSH to correlate with your T3. Mm -hmm. Meaning if someone's gauging your thyroid status by way of your TSH, if it's suppressed, it's telling them you're hyperthyroid. When in reality, I have a ton of people in my practice with suppressed TSHs out of necessity, but none of them are over-medicated on T3. None of their output hormones are through the roof to put them at risk. So that is this sort of inherited falsehood of thyroid function. So do not be afraid of a suppressed TSH. That simply tells you how much work your body's putting in to get your output hormones. How hard you're pushing on the gas pedal of a car doesn't dictate the speed, right? And that's what you're looking at, how hard you're pushing on the gas pedal. You can go push hard to go 20 miles an hour or 200 in terms of the output. Those things are very different. You have to look at the true output of your hormones, not how hard you're working for them, which is your TSH. Right. Makes sense? Am I making sense? Absolutely. Well, to me, yeah. <laughs> lots of automotive analogies here. <laughs> I love the automotive analogies. I think that's perfect. That's how people can get it though, right? It's, it's a great way to explain it if you ask me. I love it. <laughs> it's a good visual too. So how is a proper way to be tested? So I am neurotic about this and you are going mm -hmm. to hear varying opinions. I have gotten to heated discussions with the woman behind Stop the Thyroid Madness about this. We very much disagree. Oh, but for, interesting. Oh, yes. Hey, okay, let's yes. hear it. <laughs> so I am all about with thyroid predictability and control. Okay. So I want every variable accounted for so that when I increase someone's thyroid medicine and I actually increase people in small microscopic doses over time, as opposed to one or two doses at a time, I want to be able to predict where their labs are going to land based on my medication changes. I can only predict things if I start with good data, right? In order to get good data and in order to protect people from being over-medicated on T3, because every one of my patients is on some form of T3, I always capture their labs at the peak of their medication, meaning the active thyroid component in armor or nature thyroid or WP thyroid peaks and troughs in about six to eight hours. So big pearl to take away for most people. Um, most people are on single dose desiccated thyroid once a day in the morning. 
when you always minimally need to be on it in the morning and around 2 to 3 p.m. So same with Cytomel. Cytomel short acting yeah. needs to be dosed multiple times during the day, right? So, so you want to capture someone's T3 at its peak. So that can tell me what is the upper threshold? How high are they getting? So I can be sure that I always protect them from over medication. Ah, Too much. Yeah, T3. that is so the opposite of that. And why she says stop the thyroid madness would get mad at her <laughs> is there's some people that suggest don't test until 12 to 16 hours after your last dose. Yeah. So stop the thyroid madness lady wants you to wake up in the morning and go without having taken it for like 24 or you know, 20 hours. So Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a, that's too much. I, I've, I've always done it at 12 hour, 16 hour. Yeah. So, you know, and then Cytomel peaks and troughs in a shorter time. It's three to five hours. So again, right. I want to capture it at its peak. So I have people go two to three hours in. And the reason is a few patients that I've seen, there's a practice in Austin that tries to progressively manage people's thyroid, which I appreciate. They just don't, it's one of those people they're trying to do good and they're trying to help people, but it's a guessing game with them. So they're having people get labs drawn off their medication. And I've, in the last six months, I've had two older women come to me. One was 70. So increased risk for atrial fibrillation, heart attack and stroke. She had been going to see them for years and she would have her labs drawn and go to see them and her T3 would be low. And so they'd increase her medication. Three months later, six months later, she'd have her labs drawn. She'd go fasting without her medication and they'd increase her T3. They'd increase her medication. So by the time she came to me, her T3 was 11 oh, wow. when I tested it at, her, at her peak. So if you're going to put someone on Cytomel or, or Armor and you have them take it in the morning and at 3 p.m. and you have them go the next morning at 9 o'clock in the morning, they don't have T3 in their no. system. You're not checking what their medication is doing to determine if it needs to be increased. You're checking what their thyroid is doing off medication. Right. When in fact their TSH is being suppressed. So it's not even working the way that it would if they were truly off medication. So they're going to appear as though they constantly need medication increases. Right. Which is where things can actually get hairy in the realm of side effects with T3 that are dangerous. Right. So, and desiccated um, too, I would think. Right? Desiccated, yeah. it's the yeah. same. It's yeah, just... it's the same. Because the T3 is the short acting component, and that's the most important component, you know, if, mm -hmm. um, for people in the realm of functional medicine. So you want to know what that is at its peak and make decisions from there. And that's how you do it safely. And truly yeah. I find I don't need people's T3 to be high. I don't need to over medicate people. I just have to have everything very tightly controlled in a narrow window. Yeah. The catch to that, which is why I was doing it. I was doing the, the not taking the medication, then going and getting tested was Doctors and naturopaths here where I am always underdose, always. Yeah. And that so was if the I'd stop gone the thyroid in and I was looking thyroid, then my doctor wouldn't have given me any more. And I, my temperatures and I was still feeling hypo. So right. I knew that, right? Like, I'm, and it's true. It's and a catch that, 22. Yeah. So I would, I mean, prefer, I would much prefer seeing somebody like you who's doing it this way because you understand what it should look like. And that was verbatim in a, bit of an angrier tone what the stop the thyroid <laughs> madness lady told me she's like we cannot depend on these idiot doctors to you know treat people adequately yeah. and it's sad and, and it's partially true but also you know there needs to be a disclaimer in the fact of hey that's i get it because if i was a thyroid patient who didn't have an informed doctor i'd be doing the same thing i'd be manipulating my thyroid labs to not be hypothyroid I, I anymore know. Yeah. you know but also you want to understand the risk of don't don't expect to go in there every time and constantly be getting increased without knowing the risk of, hey, you're actually reading your labs off your medication. Yeah. So you want to be careful of that too. And so how do you feel about doing temperature readings to see if you are on the right amount of medication? Do you agree with that? I mean, I definitely think it's valuable. I think, um, and there's so many ways to skin a cat. Mm -hmm. I found a way that's objective and measurable that I'm able to control. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that if I am able to control it in my particular regimen, in my particular way, I give people their life back without them having to take their temperatures, Yeah, you know, pretty much like 98% of the time. So it's so much less work on their part. Yeah. And, and I just get to do my thing and I can really control it and hone in on the data the same way that reading your temperature is a way for patients to hone in on their data. 
So when you say, when you're talking about this little window, because all the ranges are different as far as numbers go, is your little window, is that like upper third of the range or? No, it's much more narrow than that. So I will, I'll tell you verbally and then I can also go to, I'll put up a link to my thyroid lab guide, which is mccallmcpherson.com forward slash gift. But the ranges verbally are TSH always needs to be well below two, ideally closer to one. Sometimes people don't feel good until it's less than one. So it can be zero if it needs to be suppressed for output hormones to be okay. Okay. Um, Obviously, output hormones and TSH don't always correlate, right? So TSH is very flexible, but it can never be too high. Then T4 needs to be between 0.9 and 1.2. That's your inactive hormone. Your active hormone needs to be between 3.4 to about 4.1. And I, you know, I modify my ranges every year or so. So it's likely going to go up to like 3.6 to 4.2 soon, but it hasn't yet. Then (laughs) reverse T3 needs to always be less than 12. Oh, nice. Ideally, not always, I should say ideally, but always less than 15. And it's like, the more robust your T3 is, the more wiggle room you have as far as your reverse T3 goes. Mm-hmm. You know, and manipulating your labs to those numbers, you know, it's a little complicated, but that's where I want things to be. And truly, if you can get people there and they still have thyroid symptoms, you go straight for the adrenals and you fix those. Yeah. You know, because when those two things work hand in hand and those numbers are tightly controlled, oh my goodness, people like. Amazing. They get their life back, guys. What's your system for the adrenals and the thyroid? There's so much, like some people are like, you have to fix the adrenals before you fix the thyroid. And, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? And so yeah. what is your take on, on what should be handled first or both at the same time? Yeah, so I used to treat the thyroid to perfection. And then people who still had residual symptoms, I would treat their adrenals. Now, the longer I do this, the more I believe by the time anybody makes it to my practice, and I'm not people's first stop in thyroid, obviously, but by the time they make it to me, every thyroid patient has some level of adrenal fatigue. So I work both simultaneously and I start to build up the adrenal glands while I treat the thyroid. Maybe in my career, five people have been unable to handle T3 because of significant adrenal dysregulation or dysfunction. So 99.999%, I have not had to treat the adrenals before I can give people T3. There are patients who really, they can't handle it. There, you give someone active thyroid hormone and their adrenal dysfunction is so bad that it just, they can't tolerate it. But 99% of the time, it's great. And if someone comes and presents to me and thinks in their mind, hey, I can't tolerate armor, I can't tolerate Cytomel, I have adrenal fatigue. I tried it with my last doctor. I can't do it. Do you know what I tell them? What? User error. Because this is so big. So everyone, this is big, y'all. So I'm a true (laughs) Texan. (laughs) So so what happens when people, most people, even in the world of functional medicine, when they try and switch someone from levothyroxine or Synthroid to Armour, to Cytomel, to whatever it is, And people come and they say, oh, I can't tolerate armor. I tried. What it is, is that doctor or clinician stopped their levothyroxine one day. And that same day, they calculated the equivalent dose of armor or Cytomel. And they switched that person. And they put them on the same day they quit taking levothyroxine. They took the equivalent dose of armor. Because textbook, that's what you're supposed to do. Well, what they did is they doubled their dose of medication in one day. And that's because levothyroxine takes 10 days for half of it to leave your system. So if you put someone on the equivalent dose that same day that you take them off of it, you have literally doubled their medication in one day. So of course, everybody's like, I can't tolerate it. I'm so shaky. I got palpitations. I was so anxious. I was crawling out of my skin is usually what they'll say. I was crawling out of my skin. And it's because they were double dosed on their thyroid. That's another real risk for atrial fibrillation. Yeah. But like when dot, when I's are dotted and T's are crossed, that stuff does not happen. The atrial wow. fibrillation kind of thing. Yeah. But yes. Remember that. Store that in your long-term memory, guys. I'm going to. Well, I'm going to. And what about when you, tr- how to treat the adrenal system? There's also 
controversy about that. And I want your opinion because yeah. some um, is like get on high amounts of Cortaf at the same time, like 25 milligrams yeah. um, or 30, which is super high, like complete suppression of right. your own cortisol. You make like 40 production. milligrams of cortisol yeah. a day. Yeah. Right. So complete suppression. Um, and then there's, you know, take the adrenal cortex or take adrenal supports, you know, take ashwagandha and take, you know, just mild adrenal support stuff. And I just, there's so much information out there and I'm really trying to get, you know, a little more focus on that from people like you who have been doing this for so long and have had such great results. So I love my adrenal system. Again, there's more than one way to, to skin yeah. fat, right? Yeah. Obviously you want to account for all lifestyle adrenal issues. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to not do high intensity workouts that are leaving you in bed for three days. You want to meditate. You want to be sure you eat protein in the morning. You want to cover all those bases. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, the things that I do that work for my patients are for 95% of them, even maybe more is one, I put people on ashwagandha at nighttime. So I separate out ashwagandha from adrenal Good. support. Yeah. yeah. Good. So I agree with that. Yeah. It helps you sleep. It helps it you restore. Yeah. Kind of carries over a little bit the next day to regulate that stress response. And so that's baseline. And I tell people expect to be on that for like years. Just yeah. stay on it. It's cheap. It's easy. There's no side effects. Just stay on it. Yeah. Then I use a super awesome adrenal supplement. This is not like an affiliate thing at all. <laughs> so I've tried a ton of adrenal supplements with my patients. The best one that I found is Orthomoleculars Adrenal. And good luck trying to buy it online. It's like impossible, but, but look around. Um, but Adrenal, and it has a little bit of cow adrenal gland in it, right? Yeah. So I have patients take it with breakfast and with lunch. It also has like micronutrients and minerals to facilitate adrenal function, adrenal healing, take a bit of the burden off of them. And people almost on a daily basis tell me it is as it's part of their treatment improvement profile as much as thyroid. So orthomoleculars adrenal that encompasses the vast majority of patients, maybe once or twice a month at most, I put people on hydrocortisone. I put them on synthetic man-made cortisol. Yeah. And I put them on small amounts and kind of like thyroid, I inch them up over time after speaking with them and hearing clinically how they're doing and put them on the bare minimum because I don't want to suppress anyone's adrenal glands. I want to like adjunctively help support it, but I don't really want to suppress it. No, I know. I did it. <laughs> Tell me, how was your experience? <laughs> well, you feel like amazing on it. That's the, that's the crazy thing is I felt like, oh my gosh, I have so much energy. This is amazing. Like yeah. it's just instant cortisol. It was like, woohoo. But you know, you get, you get, like you get, you get I was water retention. Yeah, did you, you get, get water retention? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, totally. And I had already gained weight from just getting into reverse D3. So all right, right. Mm, like my face is all puffy. My eyes are puffy. My hands like, and your blood sugar gets crazy. Like I would have to wake up in the middle of the night and eat because my stomach would be growling so hard because you're not taking it in the nighttime because then you'd be wide awake. And so I would like, I didn't laugh. I think it was a month and then I started to wean because I thought this is crazy, but it did instantly fix the reverse T3 issues that I was feeling. Like I had so yeah. many crazy side effects. Like I was getting my period every two weeks. My breasts got super uh, inflamed mm -hmm. for a month and like just all these things. And I was taking T3 and I could, couldn't feel it at all. My temperature wouldn't come up. I was still so hypothyroid. So I was like, I was desperate. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to try this Cortef. And it was instantaneously, it pulled me out of that state. Wow. Yeah. That's really good for me to hear. Thanks for telling me that because that's oh, okay. good feedback. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was it was interesting, but you get onto these forums and there's some women that have been on it for years. They've been mm -hmm. on th these high amounts of Cortef. Mm -hmm. And then like diabetes risk and like weight gain. Yeah, you have to I be mean, really careful. Yeah. Right. I mean, I mean gain more weight, not me. Like, no one that comes to my practice. I mean, by the time people make it to me, they're like, so I've gained 20 pounds. Like I can't afford to gain five more pounds, 10 more pounds. No. Yeah. As soon as I say cortisol, they're like, what? I'm like, I promise 
I won't over medicate you. It'll just be however much you're missing internally. Yeah. How much you should have walking around, you know? But yeah, it was pretty like to me that just proved so much how much the cell needs both T3 and the cortisol to function properly. Yeah. Right? Like it really needed it both in order for me to get it to work, like to get it probably into the cells. Yeah. I mean, apparently it does get in there, but it needs cortisol in there to make it work. Right. But yeah. either way, it was, it did pull me out of it pretty fast. <laughs> but yeah, like if you forget, like you have to take like safety doses with you because right. if something traumatic happened while you were out and about, let's say you got in a car accident, yeah. you could actually die. Because you, if you don't have the cortisol in your system, which is I mean, crazy. that's a high risk scenario. That's a high risk scenario. It's not, it's not good. It's not safe. <laughs> no. So, so the person, let's go back now. Let's go back to our patient who's on the Synthroid. Is there any person in your practice that is on T4 only? No, not one. Yes. Not one. I mean, and you know, I think that there are people who can do it. They never make it to me. I yes, think sure. Yeah. Like these right. excellent converters out yeah. there, God bless them. You God know, rock all. on sister. The one in a million. Yes. That there? one in a million. So lucky. <laughs> You're so, so lucky. You have no idea. Um, so they're definitely not listening to this podcast right now. <laughs> you know, they're like off in la la land with their synthroid. No, I don't have one patient. By the time people come to me, every single person in my practice is on some form of T3. Awesome. And how many people just on T3 only? Is that becoming more? You know, I only put people on pure T3 in the cases of severe uh, conversion issues. Right. So, you know, where people show up to me not on any thyroid medication and their reverse T3 is 22, and which is high. I mean, it, it's still within normal range. That's crazy high. And, you know, their T3 is 2 point, even 2.9. Those people are debilitated. And so I can't do anything with any T4 because that's going to do nothing but shunt to reverse T3. So the, the people who need T3 only are TSH is irrelevant, but people who have elevated T4 and even moderately elevated reverse T3, if it's severely elevated for sure, but even okay reverse T3 with a sequestering of T4 and a low T3, those people need T3 only because no matter how much T4 you give them, they're going to stockpile it and then they're going to shunt it to reverse T3. Yeah. And even in the case of Armour Thyroid, Armour Thyroid 75% T4. If you give those in 25% T3, if you give them more T3, T4, they're going to stockpile it and shunt it to reverse T3 and any minimal effect they get from the added 25% T3 isn't going to be enough if they're that bad of a converter. Mm -hmm. And one more question in your practice, actually two more questions in your practice. Sure. Um, what are you, what do you find is the main cause of, cause I think that's, this is something that I really want to get pe my listeners to understand is there's usually a cause. Sometimes it's genetics, right? Sometimes yeah. it is familial and it runs through the family and it's genetics. You might not have the enzymes that convert T4 to T3, but if it's not those things, which it's not usually, mm -hmm. I don't think, right? What are you seeing as being the most, like the highest thing that you're seeing as far as root cause goes? I would say it's hard for me to objectively know, mm -hmm. but I would say inflammation. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I would say inflammation is the driving factor. And, and I'm such a both and person. I'm a, you know, what if 30% of it comes from inflammation and 10% of it comes from micronutrient depletion and 20% comes from stress and cumulatively you have this reverse T3 problem. And I think for so many of us, just because most of us have a terrible lifestyle that's ridden with stress and chemical food and environmental toxins and poor microbiome function, all of these things that contribute to this issue and that collectively we as a society are just not a society, a society that can sustain Synthroid. Yeah. 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 And my last question was kind of, you answered it a little bit, but if you want to expand it all, why is there such an epidemic for women specifically with like, with hypothyroidism? I mean, it's gone crazy. I feel like everybody has it. It's really my belief that if you are a woman, 
especially if you're a woman with children, it is not a matter of if, but when with proper diagnostic skills. Oh, thank yeah. you, McCall. Yes, I completely agree. It's like every woman now that comes in my door, I'm like, you have to check your, your thyroid. You just yes. have to. Yeah. Yes. Before we do anything, check your thyroid. <laughs> right. And thank God, because they could leave and never have anyone really look at their thyroid again for 25 more years, yeah. you know, like you're their one and only hope. So yeah, you have to. Um, you know, it's hard for, it's hard for me to know a lot of, a lot of people will say that it's Hashimoto's, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, that it's, that. which is driven by inflammation. And sure, in my practice in Austin, 80% of my hypothyroid patients, in fact, do not have Hashimoto's. Uh, mine neither. And it's so yeah. funny because every functional medicine doctor and every book I read, it's everybody yep. says the number one cause of hypothyroidism is Hashimoto's. And I'm, I'm waiting. I've been dealing with thyroid people now for years and I'm like, once in a while, I have somebody that has high antibodies, but most yeah. of the time, no. Agreed. And um, yeah, I mean, I think maybe that's the one thing they can find and determine yeah. maybe that causes it. But the vast majority of my people do not have Hashimoto's. Now, Austin yeah. is a health conscious city. Mm-hmm. So, like, I used to have a practice also outside of Houston, which is not so much a health conscious city. And uh, 80% of my patients there did have Hashimoto's. So it was a complete 180 degree opposite. But I definitely find Hashimoto's patients for me are the exception, not the rule. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a very complex thing of, of a both and scenario again. I think a lot of it is, you know, uh, part viruses, part environmental toxins that just really degrade our hormone function in general and increase our inflammation, which tears our body down and makes us age so much more quickly. I just, again, I think it's almost, we live in this society that promotes thyroid dysfunction and we just have to be on top of our game to fix it and help facilitate healing and prevention at any opportunity. Yeah. Do you see people outside of Austin? Like, can you do, I know you can't prescribe, correct? Right. So well, Unless you see them in person. Right. So I make my out of state, out of patient, out of the country patients fly in for their first appointment and then I do virtual medicine. And then my PA that I've trained myself um, does non-medical consults where she'll sit down with you. She'll look at your labs. She'll give you a plan that you can then take to your doctor to facilitate in a letter um, to help people who can't quite make it to see us. But we try to make it as easy as possible where they come in, fly in. I see you do a physical exam, have a good thorough appointment, and then we just follow up virtually or by phone. And then you can prescribe virtually as well after that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think I'm just going to start making people fly out to see you then. Great. Fantastic. <laughs> I have so many clients in the States who are just banging their head. Like you heard that email. It's, it's horrible. And they cannot get the help that they need. And so. it doesn't take me long. It's crazy. But at least 80% of my people on their first treatment cycle get better. They come back and they see me, oh my gosh, I'm so much better than I was. I still have to do more treatment cycles, but they come back and almost always say, McCall, I'm so much better than I was. I still feel like I could get better and I'm not where I want to be, but I'm already so much better than I was. It's worth it. I mean, it's life changing. I was going to say that it is so worth it. Like, so it costs you, let's say a thousand dollars to go on the trip and for the appointment or whatever it is. Is that not worth the quality of the rest of your life, life? the rest of your life? And I'll tell you, lady, we'll both tell you we've been there and it's like night and day. Like you get to actually live your life. You don't realize just how crummy you're feeling right now until you can actually start to feel normal again with normal amounts of thyroid. Thyroid's everywhere in our body. It's everything. And I tell my patients frequently, I'm like, look, it's such a, I literally would be on disability by now. If the person who didn't give me back my life, didn't give me back, who the person who gave me back my life didn't truly, I would be a non-functioning member of society because it is that awful. Meanwhile, I, instead I get to like all day, every day, give my thyroid patients their life back. You know, I mean, there is no amount of money. And really my patients never say, oh gosh, I wish I didn't spend that money coming to see you. But I have, I mean, people save up between appointments all the time because it is your life. There is nothing not worth having your life back, being a better mother, being a better wife, being a better employer, employee, a friend, being able to show up in your life. And truly thyroid makes or breaks that. It really does. And that, that, nice new home and the new car and the new clothes and the new shoes. None of that 
matters if you feel like garbage. So quit wasting the money on that stuff and start putting it on yourself. It's so crazy what we decide to spend our money on. It blows my mind that people will, won't hesitate to go out and purchase a brand new home with a higher mortgage or a brand new car or the new dress, whatever it is, but yet they won't spend the money on their body, on themselves and on their health, which is, is should be number one, right? It gets a darn good return on investment. It really, really does. You know, like any money they spend to come see me, they definitely make back in their productivity. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I can't tell you enough how much I've enjoyed this conversation. McCall, I've really, it's, it's great. Like I love it. And I, I am, I'm sending you so many people. <laughs> Good. Please do. I have so many people that I need to help. Yeah, you really do. And between us, I'll just start shoveling. I do all the weight loss stuff. So I'll just start like sending Ooh. people your way. And I, mean, I can't send my way. Canadians, but I can send you my, most of my clients are from the States. So amazing. I know. I know. Oh, so I need to talk to you so I can send you some people. <laughs> yes. I have many American doctors who send me oh, I bet. their clients to lose the weight. So right. It's funny. No, I need yeah. help with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have plenty of people for you. We'll talk, McCall. We'll talk. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. And I'm going to put in the show notes, your free gift so everyone can go and grab that and go check you out on your website and book their appointment with you. Thanks for Thank having you. me. This was such a blast.